Hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this uh, discussion on some interesting topics on policy research uh, by Mulle Foundation. And we have with us today Ruben Poblete Kasinave, who's a PhD from University College London, and he's recently joined the Erasmus School of Economics uh, as a postdoctoral researcher. And to give a brief um, idea about his research interests, uh, I'll ask him to talk about it soon, but just he's uh, he has done several work on Indian data that deals with uh, the misuse of political power, crime, and various sorts of things along that line and their impact on the economy as a whole. He uses both the empirical and theoretical approach to analyze his findings. So welcome, Ruben, to this discussion. Happy to have you here. And before we start off, could you please talk a little bit about your interests and um, you know throw light for our audience on that? Yeah, um, so thank you very much for the invitation, Panchali. It's a, it's a really, it's a nice pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, as you said, like uh, my main uh, research areas are in political economy, development, and economics. So I have been uh, mainly interested uh, in studying topics that are related with uh, kind of like social injustices and human, human behavior in general, uh, with a particular focus on abuse of power, corruption, and crime. Um, so most of my research uh, has been related to corruption and the capacity of the incumbent politicians to abuse their political power. Right. And, and you have done quite a bit of work on Indian data as well. Yeah, yeah. So basically uh, how I started to work with India, it was basically uh, because I, I have one question in mind in particular. Uh, which is uh, related to whether elected politicians uh, get special treatment in courts. Sure. And I try uh, to find a good context uh, to answer this, this particular question in, in a proper way. And I explore so many different uh, countries, uh, Chile, I'm from Chilean, um, Italy, Brazil, and so on. And, and India presented a good, uh, an ideal context to answer this question. And then I just got very interested in the country. There's like so many stark differences uh, inequality across the societies we know in terms of gender, religion, race, and so on. Um, so yeah, so after that, I, I just go fully involved uh, in analyzing uh, different topics in, in the Indian context. Sure. I mean, yeah, it's a very, very demographically, culturally heterogeneous country. And I think that that gives us a big set to work on a lot of different things. So um, on that note, I mean, uh, one of your papers is on whether politicians receive special treatment uh, in courts. Uh, once they hold their power of, I mean, once they're in position in their power positions. So just uh, to take up that analysis of yours. So recently we had the Bihar elections, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. and and so it, in this elections, it, it some of the sources have come out with some data pointers which says that the can number of candidates with criminal records they have increased um, this time. And out of the 241 newly elected leaders from all parties, about 68% have declared their criminal cases, right? And so this uh, data comes from basically uh, something called the Association for Democratic Reforms and something called the Election Watch. And this is, of course, higher than the last time uh, compared to 2015, where about 58% have uh, had declared criminal cases against them. So uh, given that piece of information, I mean, the idea is it's a democracy. And of course, the people are sort of voicing their opinion by voting for the elected representatives. But this voting is happening and this choice is being uh, signaled uh, despite knowing that these people have some criminal records in the background. And uh, so given that information that they have criminal records, they're still coming to power. So once they're in power, do you, does your study find that they really face some special treatment in courts? Yeah, so actually the case of Bihar is quite interesting uh, compared to the rest of the states. This sure. is the, the state that has the largest share of the candidates facing criminal cases uh, before election. And unfortunately, this share has been increasing uh, throughout the election. So recently, as you just said, like one out of three candidates yeah. had declared pending criminal cases before the election. And which is something more even concerning is that 70% um, of the, winnen, the winners have a pending case. And, and among those cases, they're like very serious uh, criminal offenses, such as murder and rape, uh, and among others. Right. So uh, in my study, what I analyze is uh, whether these candidates who are seated in the, who win a seat in the legislative assembly, whether their criminal cases uh, receive a special treatment in court, right? 
One of the biggest problems about this is that uh, in general, uh, we have always uh, heard about these stories in the media for several different countries, but they haven't been any, any type of uh, rigorous study looking at this. Um, and one of the problems of, of this kind of thing is that um, uh, whether um, any type of individual can get equal, equal justice. And if this is not the case, this is one of the, one of the biggest violations of one of the most fundamental human rights, right? Which sure. is uh, equality uh, before the law. So in terms of our research, uh, I look particularly at the candidates who win a seat in the legislature. And I do find that they get a, a special, uh, special treatment in their, in, the, in their criminal cases. Mm -hmm. But uh, how these uh, are affected crucially depends on whether they belong or not to uh, the main political party, uh, the, the, the ruling party at the state level. All right. So, uh, so I mean, is it's a state level analysis? Uh, your this this uh, analysis? Yeah, yeah. So I look at candidates for running for all of these legislative assemblies. So I use uh, data from the the same source uh, that you mentioned, right. the Association for Democratic Reform, mm -hmm. uh, which is based on the guys that uh, these candidates since uh, are, uh, are ruling from the Supreme Court uh, right. uh, of black candidates since two thousand and three to mm -hmm. report any type of pending criminal cases uh, before the elections. So I grab those uh, information and I analyze what happened with these criminal cases mm -hmm. if the politician uh, gets elected. And I track these criminal cases uh, during the period of the election. Um, what I analyze are uh, all of these candidates from different uh, states uh, assemblies. And I find that they, they, uh, those who win a seat in the legislature and also belongs to the ruling party, mm -hmm. their criminal cases are 17% uh, more likely to be close without a conviction. And something that is interesting as well is uh, the fact that also winners from other parties have also different uh, effects. But in, this, in terms of, the, uh, of these winners from other parties, uh, their criminal cases are 15% less likely uh, to be closed during the period of the legislature. So we observe this kind of like very different um, behavior in the legal system when we analyze candidates that both will succeed in the, in, in the legislature, but they uh, do not, uh, they uh, um, belong to different parties, and particularly uh, the, the party at the state level. Right, right. So, but, but it's like, it's not uh, the, so this, this uh, special treatment is only applicable for some specific crimes that they have committed, or is it like a broad cohort of uh, violations on their part? Yeah, so the, 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 the effects that I told you recently, uh, so these are the, uh, the aggregate level, but it's interesting that you're raising this point because at the very end, the, the, the cases that we are observing uh, that uh, have certain uh, judicial discretion, uh, say, um, on the bright side are only cases that are non-serious. So all the kind of like serious criminal cases, such as the one I mentioned, uh, attempt of murder, uh, rape, uh, or any type of violence uh, mm -hmm. crimes against women, those uh, criminal cases, fortunately, I do not observe any type of judicial discretion, regardless of whether you win the election or not, or to which political party uh, you belong to. So that's uh, the good side. But on the other side, um, uh, cases uh, that are non-serious, uh, still we observe uh, severe uh, differences uh, for politicians who sure. get a seat in the, in the legislature or not. Sure. So, I mean, it's, it's a... Um, so the brighter side is that maybe the rule of law is still operational um, in one of the largest democracies that we have in India, that is. And so the major crimes are probably, uh, we hope that they're getting, uh, you know, the proper verdict and the judicial treatment that they're supposed to. But, but when it comes to the smaller crimes uh, for which they are being specially treated. So uh, can, is it possible to comment on that aggregate effect of those crimes particularly? So even if the crimes are minor in nature compared to some more severe crimes, so mm -hmm. do we have any um, sort of uh, um, some something to say in the lines of that the number of MLAs who commit those crimes are much larger compared to the number of MLAs who commit probably the more severe crimes. So the net effect might be uh, more in case of the non-severe crimes. Can we comment something like that or is it it's too soon to state that? Well, uh... It's difficult to say actually why is the reason uh, of why do we don't observe uh, that, for instance, like criminal, serious criminal cases, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we don't observe any type of judicial discretion in those serious criminal cases. 
there might be potential reasons uh, such as, I don't know, it's, it's, it's much harder to, to try to uh, avoid certain type of evidence. Um, I don't know. So, so it's very hard to uh, explore why are the reason why we're observing these cases and not the others. Maybe there's like more media attention for serious criminal cases. And maybe that's the reason why we don't observe uh, judicial discretion in those sense. Maybe the, the media will know it. Uh, in terms of the other, it's really hard to tell because at the very end, like, uh, unfortunately, uh, in several states, as mm -hmm. is the case of Bihar, there are certain candidates that have uh, multiple criminal cases. Sure. So at the very end, it's like, super hard to, uh, to have like, a, these comparisons about uh, serious criminal cases and non-serious criminal cases. Uh, one candidate has like, more than 50 mm -hmm. uh, criminal cases. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them were serious and some of them are non-serious. So it's really hard to have like, a... Uh, a, a number for the question that, that, that sure. you were asking. Sure. So it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's not that simple to disentangle the effects of by by the type of crimes that they commit. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, talking about crimes. Um, so given this year has been quite a, a dreadful year in that context. I mean, because of the lockdown and the virus and everything is a, has been a standstill for a very very prolonged period of time, mm -hmm. and now things have started opening up a little bit. Um, but uh, in, in, in context of the lockdown, if we talk, if we go back to the incidences of crime, then in context of Bihar, um, so uh, do you have uh, any findings, particularly in context of Bihar uh, and the crimes committed during the period of lockdown, particularly because of uh, sort of systemic change that happened? Because people were confined to home. So on one hand, you have emptier streets, but on the other hand, you have too many people at home to put it in a very simplistic language. So how does that yeah. work with the crime scenario in not just Bihar, but maybe across Indian states? Yeah, so uh, one of the research I have been uh, doing is also uh, in the case of Bihar for certain type of criminal cases, mm -hmm. and also for uh, crimes uh, against women uh, for the whole India. Uh, one of the interesting facts uh, about the lockdown in India, as you were saying, like it's not only there were like it, it was the biggest lockdown in the world, sure. and it was uh, not only that it was like super strict at some mm -hmm. points in, in time. There's like a lot of variation as well in terms of the uh, the restriction that what they were in place in different districts. So there mm -hmm. was a lot of things that you can be that we can explore uh, and see what are the effects in terms of the aggregate crime. Um, the lockdown particularly uh, have some uh, some immediate impacts uh, on criminal activity in general. Mm -hmm. As you just mentioned, one of the main reasons, like okay, you go to the street and there's like fewer people on the street, so it's not only like there's like less potential victims, but sure. maybe there's like uh, less uh, potential offenders uh, going around. So for this reason, then you might observe a, a large reduction in crime. But on the other hand, um, there's another important component. Uh, such as is the case of the police. The police in, in many other countries, as is the case of India, there, there was an institution in charge of enforcing the lockdown, right? Sure. So there were like a lot of uh, resources that they were taking from the police uh, in terms of crime prevention policies towards enforcement of the lockdown, mm -hmm. which actually can increase criminal activity because the police was in charge of, uh, of doing something different from the normal activities. And this might increase criminal, uh, criminal cases. Um, crime in general, uh, which is particularly concerning mm -hmm. uh, in the case of Bihar, given that is uh, the, one of the states with the lowest number of police officers in the country. Right. So it's about uh, 100,000. So for uh, per 100,000 uh, people, mm -hmm. there are 81 police officers, which is very low. It's almost half of the, of the average in India. Uh, so in those cases, like here, we have like these two opposing forces. Another one that we we don't know what's going to happen. But what we observe is that uh, in general, there's a, a large reduction in, in aggregate crime, mm -hmm. which is about uh, sixty percent. And this was like immediate after the the, the position of the lockdown. Sure. And and so uh, when we focus on a particular state, so then uh, given that like you just mentioned that each state had been then categorized into various. Uh, regions based on the severity of lockdowns. Mm -hmm. So if you look at one certain state, any state for that matter, and then uh, does the crime type and the rate or the frequency vary based on those regions that are categorized uh, differently based on the severity of lockdowns? 
So, well, I, I haven't studied um, the cases of different type of crimes for all of the states. I, so what I type of use, uh, the information that I use for analyzing this for Bihar uh, is based on the first information report, uh, which mm -hmm. is uh, present like very detailed information. Apart from that, mm -hmm. it's like, this is the more granular information that we can find like for uh, criminal cases in India. In general, like uh, information at the district level and monthly. Sure. So here we cannot explore much. With this information that I have, then, then we can uh, track down like what are the exact pattern at mm -hmm. the moment of the lockdown. Um, something that you mentioned is interesting in the sense that uh, the the um, the type of crime uh, matters, particularly yeah. those that are uh, that occur in general in public spaces versus mm -hmm. others that occur in several different situations. In that case, for instance, uh, one of the uh, we, we have observed already like. Uh, uh, news on the media and in other countries that certain type of crimes such as uh, domestic violence has been increasing substantially because of the of the lockdown, mainly because uh, the perpetrator and the victim are confined to the same space for a very prolonged period of time, which right. of course intensifies the, the situation. Sure. So yeah. So on that note, I mean, uh, the moment we say that they are they are the, both the perpetrator and the victim are possibly confined to this space uh, in their own spaces or might be even there they belong to the same space so in this context i mean um, so do you have any uh, findings regarding domestic violence uh, in this phase of lockdown or right before lockdown and then during lockdown and post lockdown do yeah. these figures vary for domestic violence the the information that i have from from the police report uh, do not report anything particularly in domestic violence mm -hmm. although i have information at, about uh, assaults against women Right. Uh, in, the, in that case, uh, I observed like a large reduction because of the lockdown uh, in about uh, 70%. Uh, um, but mainly, as, as you know, the context, uh, most of the assaults uh, uh, occur in public spaces, mm -hmm. right? Mainly in public transport. So maybe that's the reason of this issue sure. in, 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 in this type of crimes. But on the other hand, I, I use other type of information to explore a little bit is what happened with uh, other type of crimes against women. Mm -hmm. And this is information is coming from the National Commission uh, for Women. Mm -hmm. And the interesting part is that that covers the, the whole country. So we can explore a little bit what happened in different regions, uh, depending on the, on the type of restrictions. Right. What I observed with those kind of, um, uh, this type of crimes uh, against women, which includes domestic violence, harassment, Mm -hmm. I initially observed a, a decrease in 50% of those crimes, nearly. Uh, but then, uh, as the lockdown progressed, mm -hmm. there is a sharp increase again. And it, this is very interesting that, to observe that, in particular, with the uh, uh, district zones that they were like classified as red, if you mm -hmm. remember those with, uh, with the sure. high restriction, um, the number of crimes uh, against women is over 100% compared to what they were before the lockdown. So in this, in this sense, uh, this uh, certain district are experienced a much more uh, violence against women uh, compared to what they used to have. And the problem with that is at the very end, if you, if you think about a certain type of uh, violence against women, such as domestic violence, once that this situation occurs, it's gonna keep occurring afterwards. So these are like right. uh, way, um, permanent victims. And that's something that we should take care about uh, in the long run as well. Sure. Yeah, of course, because it's more of a sort of a continuous and pro probably even a habitual process. I mean, once yeah. a person is victimized once, it there's always a tendency to be victimized further. And usually sure. in case of domestic violence, uh, the reportings have always been terribly low um, in, mm -hmm. in the Indian context. I mean, we have yeah. different sorts of helplines and uh, people who... The victims can resort to but even then um, it has been the the help seeking has been quite low which is a concern of course a concern yeah. no, definitely. Um, definitely. sure so um, so given I mean in so now that we have the context of crime particularly during the period of lockdown as your analysis suggests uh, there um, so aggregate crime has uh, sort of reduced and we have intuition enough for that uh, but then there are also certain districts, the red districts, which have experienced an increase in crimes against women per se. So mm -hmm. given these information that we have in context of the pandemic induced lockdown, uh, what do you think? Uh, I mean, is it possible to comment on some policy that might be prescribed uh, in this context or if not policy, what are the challenges that like, might lie ahead? Because 
this phase is now to stay so even if the lockdowns are eased which is already in place and even if people are sort of in a way started to go back to their normal lives and things have been reissuing their operation uh, gradually but even then there's been a lot of um, operational changes so many many companies many workplaces have now made the work from home permanent um, yeah. so these have different implications for a culturally heterogeneous country like india so where uh, there are um, completely different models of uh, cohabiting uh, women tend to stay with their in-laws their husbands and more people there is a space crunch so all these cultural factors are at play so given these information broadly in place what do you think could be a policy challenge or any challenge in this context well as you were saying um it's it's kind of hard to put one type of policy in place especially uh as in the case of india there's like so much variation in the type of uh, societal context uh, across different states a mm -hmm. uh, uh, type of culture uh, i always like to think about like india as a as a huge country composed by different countries right sure. um tell about the in terms of the the lockdowns it is it's, it's kind of like tricky because at the very end when 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 you're trying to impose this you have like one purpose in mind just mm -hmm. to tackle the the spread of the the spread of the of the covid-19 right but there are a lot of other unintended consequences that mm -hmm. are going with that decision so one thing that I, I can say is that actually like the severity and the duration of the lockdown matters as a in terms of this, uh, the crime, the, the things that we are discussing. So um, I think one of the key uh, things that the, the government had to do is, is, is try to focus on identifying what are the vulnerable groups that actually might be, uh, might be perceiving uh, long-term consequences because of the lockdown. Sure. So this could be, for instance, like groups that are facing severe economic impact Mm -hmm. uh, such as I don't know uh, groups that are lose uh, people that are uh, losing their jobs and then right. therefore like they, they don't have like a, any savings or the capacity to find a job in, in the short term or in the medium term. Um, it's actually this this kind of group might be actually like being forced to uh, go into crime, for instance, right? And right. start like stealing and so on. So I think like uh, in this, in this type of groups, like maybe like uh, try to offer financial packages. Mm -hmm. uh, would, that would allow to help their, their financial distress, that would be something good. Uh, but then first you have to identify what are the vulnerable, vulnerable groups and how to reach them. The same happened with, the, with, the, with victims of violence in the case of mm -hmm. the women, right? Uh, as you just mentioned, uh, one of the biggest problems, not only in India, the whole world is about like uh, reporting. Sure. How do we help this situation? How do we make feel uh, women that are uh, comfortable about going approaching the police in some places we have a uh, police station that are uh, mm. bas basically uh, composed by women police officers and that has been like a uh, one good improvement in the situation but it's still like uh, we are far from getting there right and, yeah. and and that's one step but then what happened what type of support do you are providing to to women that actually have been suffering from from this uh, type of violence um, so these are the kind of things that we have to think about uh, about the future. What are the consequences that uh, we are going to uh, face in the future because of the lockdown? Sure. So I think the couple of key takeaways that we can have from your analysis and your work on um, such uh, uh, severely important topics in the Indian context is to, particularly in case of crime in this phase of lockdown and the virus, which is to stay and which is concerning, is mm -hmm. to just uh, to start off with making the network of support more tractable and more transparent Definitely. and more reachable possibly and to devise some mechanism for uh, uh, motivating the women to come and seek help uh, at least mm -hmm. to take the first step and then having enough manpower to ensure that there is enough enforcement and enough reaching out to the women who are victims who have been victims of these crimes um, and the second would be for the government to possibly focus and target some financially weaker sections of the society or socioeconomically weaker sections of the society yeah. and who are potentially um, perpetrators uh, because of the mm. job losses and the livelihood loss yeah. uh, in context of the, of the pandemic. Yeah. yeah so. So, the, the, can I say, yeah. so something that is very interesting in this is that oh, there's like two types of policies, right? One is like target, uh, targeted toward the big teams, right? Mm -hmm. And try to help them provide like psychological therapy and these sure. kind of things. 
another is also to the perpetrator, right? Because sure. at the very end, we have to go to uh, what is the nature uh, of, of this violence, what causes this violence. And I think uh, there's a lot to explore about like, what are the channels, why this happened? Is it mainly, I don't know, uh, is it alcohol related? Is this mm-hmm. just, uh, as you were saying, uh, it's just because maybe like financial stress was all another reason sure. um, for this uh, violence. So I think that's something that is all, is kind of like missing in the in the agenda. Not only in India, it's like in most countries. Uh, most is only focused on victims, but then we have to also tackle the perpetrators, right? Sure, sure, absolutely. Because there are always uh, two sides in that uh, incident. So if if some policy action has to be taken to control that incident, then it has to be yeah. focused on either sides of the incident. So both for the perpetrator as well as for the victim. And as a society. Or, as a, as and a, as well as the society, of course, as a whole. Yes, yeah. definitely. So thank you, Ruben, for that very illuminating um, discussion on some topics that I find very contextual and very, very important in these present times. And we hope our audience enjoys uh, this discussion. Uh, we'll be putting the video up uh, for everybody to take a look uh, at the Mulia website. Uh, you just need to wait for uh, some time probably to uh, get it, get the video first hand. And for anybody who's interested to um, check out Ruben's work, his research papers, and his topics. Uh, you can access his website. Uh, Ruben, if you don't mind sharing your website address with our audience. No, for sure. Uh, and actually, like, if any of you have any question or interest in this topic, uh, please uh, contact me. All my contact details are in my uh, website. I don't know. You're gonna share the the website in the in the. Uh, yes, you. Uh, we we will share the website address with our audience. Uh, uh, yeah. You can just uh, just uh, mention that now for them. Uh, so it's like www.poblete.casenave.com. Uh, 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 that's my website. Uh, and then uh, you can find my email there. Uh, and if you have any question, for sure, like as I said, please, I'm, I'm, very, help, uh, I'm very glad if you can uh, send me an email and then we can discuss uh, any type of curiosity that you have. I'm always happy to, to chat about uh, uh, research and also like a uh, context-wise uh, related question. Yeah. Sure, sure. I, I hope our audience will um, reach out to you and because these are important things to talk about and many people are very concerned about the, these things. So we need a bigger ecosystem to talk about these For things sure. to make these a public discourse. So Exactly, like public awareness is one of the important things in, in this yes. topic. Recognize yes. the first Absolutely. issues and then see what we have to do about it. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you, Ruben. Um, And uh, we hope to see you in future again in this platform to talk about more stuff, more interesting things uh, that we can always discuss. Yeah, for sure. I would be happy to to do so. Uh, Hopefully after COVID and when we can meet in India. But yes, definitely. So come Absolutely. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Bachali. Bye. Bye.